don't know me, my name's Barry Cranford. Uh, I'm the founder of the LJC and run a uh, recruitment business called RecWorks. Um, I'm not going to give it a big pitch, but I'll put some words there. So if you're interested in learning more about what we do, um, we do a bunch of stuff around introductions to mentors and, and helping with aspiring speakers and, and loads of other things on top of recruitment stuff. So if you want to find out more, have a read of that. Uh, but I am going to get out of the way now. Uh, so first up, we have Dominica. So Dominica, whenever you're ready, feel free to, to share away. Thank you very much. Uh, right, let me just share my screen. Can I just double check that you can see my screen? Okay, yeah. brilliant, thank you. Uh, right, so my name is Dominica. Um, I did, it's just my first ever lightning talk, so please be gentle. <laughs> I didn't really know what to talk about, so I thought, well, what's better than to talk about than myself? So I will take you through uh, the, my career change from a lawyer uh, to a software developer. So from litigation to application, to give it a snappy title. When I was, so when I was uh, younger, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I did well at uh, law at A-levels, so I thought, well, I'll just go to uni and do that. So I went to University of Bradford. Um, and then I was kind of on, a, on that journey. I thought, well, I've done law, should probably qualify as a lawyer, which is what I did. I qualified as a chartered legal executive. I then worked in civil litigation for a number of years. So things like personal injury and commercial property litigation. Um, so a lot of court work, things like that. And what I do now is completely different. I'm a software developer at Sky. I'm also doing a computer science degree at Bax New University. And I'm an, a bootcamp instructor at Black Coder in my spare time. So it's totally different. You may be thinking, well, why? Why would I want to do such a change from an established career to something totally different? And the answer is fairly simple. And if anyone doesn't recognize the picture, it's bison grass vodka, uh, which coincidentally is, is produced in the local area to where I'm from in Poland. But really, it's, this sort of describes a lot of, of who I am as a person. So I have a big Polish family. And one of our family days, my brother, who's also a developer, talked about how difficult his job is. But at the same time, he's very active on the family WhatsApp group. So I knew that it can't be that hard if he's got the time during the day to send us loads of memes. So as a bet, I told him that I will learn to code to show him that his job is actually not that hard. And that's how it started. So three years ago, I've, I've learned, decided to learn to code as a bit of a bet. So how did I do it? I started with the internet. So a few Google searches later, I found Free Code Camp, which uh, has a set curriculum of web development. So I started with sort of CSS, HTML, the real starting um, point for a lot of new developers. I then used some YouTube videos to pick up on different things. And once I got a little bit more into it, I've decided to go to some local meetups, maybe meet some like-minded people, people that are going free to sit the same thing. Um, I also signed up to the 100 Days of Code pledge on Twitter. For anyone who hasn't come across it, it is what it says. Um, you, just, you just pledge to code every day for 100 days and tweet about it for everyone to know and keep you ac accountable. Now, I also wouldn't be a software developer if I didn't credit Stack Overflow for the career journey. Um, and finally, during this, whilst I was learning for a number of weeks, I realized that somewhere along the lines, I actually fell in love with coding. It, it was something that I was missing in my current role, that the challenge wasn't quite there. So I decided that I wanted to make it a career. Um, so it wasn't a great breakthrough. It's just something clicked, a bit like solving a coding problem. And that's when I found the Get Into Tech Bootcamp run by Sky, sort of a part-time course that teaches you, that really brings together the stuff that I, that I learned online um, and you create a sort of a full stack website at the end of it. And once I have completed that course, I was given the opportunity uh, to apply to Sky for the graduate scheme and it was successful. And that's really where my career took off in software. Uh, so all that took about eight months 
um, whilst I was full time working and learning to code part time. Um, and that really leads me nicely onto some of the challenges that I've experienced. Um, so it was really hard to really figure out, especially at the start, what I should learn. Um, there's loads of stuff out there on the internet, so many courses. Uh, so I was quite lucky with Free Code Camp uh, because it's got a set curriculum, but I could have gone with something else and maybe taught, learned different things. It's really hard to find. Um, it's also quite isolate, isolating when you learn it on your own. And that's why I've decided to, to go to some local meetups. But that really took me out, outside of my con comfort zone. Um, I thought when I'm going to show up at these meet meetups, people are just going to laugh at me because I don't know anything. And they're technical meetups. So why would someone not technical be there? But turns out great. I've made some great friends, loads of people who inspired me to taught me so many different things. And, that, and also, that, so that sort of leads me nicely on to learning online is that it's really hard to learn with our teacher. You're always, it almost takes you twice as long because you read something and it doesn't quite click. So you've got to look elsewhere and then look elsewhere and it finally does. But I think it, it's easier if you've got someone teaching you. Uh, so that was probably a biggest challenge at the start. And finally, the, the time com commitments. So I, when I was learning to code, I coded pretty much every day for eight months. Uh, I'd come home from work and I'd just write a bit of code, learn something new, try out different things. Um, my, so my social life definitely took a hit, um, but it was all worth it. I now have a much better understanding of what I can, can and can't do with my time and how to give myself a break. Um, and I should probably mention as well that crazy long commute times. Uh, so I'm based in Birmingham. The course I did with Sky is in London. So once a week, I would go to work for 7.30, do my full day of work, um, which was quite busy as well. I finished for 3.30, I drive for two and a half hours to get to London, do three hours of learning, and then drive home for another two hours. So it was like a crazy packed day and I definitely wouldn't do that again, but I knew that it was a means to an end and really uh, brought me to where I wanted to be. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from Dolly Parton. If you don't like the roads you're walking on, start paving another one, which is exactly what I did and it very much worked for me. Um, my details on the slide if anyone's got any questions or wanted to have a chat about career changes. But that's it for me. Thank you very much, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dominica. And with five seconds to go, that was in incredibly well timed. Um, so 100 days of code. And by the way, if anyone's got any questions, then, then unmute your mic and I can see who you are and I can, I can just invite you in. But 100 days of code. How, how was that? How did you find that? Um, I definitely thought it was very motivating because there were days when I was like oh maybe I just don't want to do anything um, and I thought well no because I've played I've committed to this so maybe I should just learn a tiny little concept and it just got me that little bit further so you definitely some days were really really hard but others were quite easy but it was good to because I tweeted about it every day uh, and I'm not as active on Twitter anymore um, but because I did tweet about it every day it really kept me accountable uh, and there's loads of people that do it um, at various times there's loads of people doing it at the moment so it's good to see that that there is that bit of community as well yeah I can, I can really imagine that properly immersing yourself into something and and um and yeah learning as a part of it um does anyone have any questions sam i can see you've um, you've unmuted there did you um did you want to jump in with something yeah, I do. It's something to what I'm going through now. And it's great to hear that from somebody else's perspective in terms of the, like, the education you've gone through. Um, it's just fantastic. So it'd be, I suppose when you transition um, to a career path, you know, I suppose like skills or experience to where you're going, where you are. Sorry, Sam, you're cutting off a little bit. So I'm Ron. not quite getting a question. Now. run out in terms of like skill sets or knowledge sorry I, I didn't get the full question he, he froze for a little oh. bit am i back now okay. uh, it's sort still of, cutting off. you're in and out a bit i think at the moment sam um i'll put it in the chat because i'm not sure if it's <laughs> okay cool did, did anyone cast and i noticed you you went unmuted as well did you have anything you wanted to ask just while sam's putting that in the in the chat there 
Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thanks for your presentation. Just one question. When you learned how to code, how did you know whether you were any good in coding? I mean, um, I didn't. I, I just learned things and tried to apply it. So free code comes got little projects and I just work at creating these projects. Uh, but yeah, I, I had no idea whether I was good or not. Uh, I just I just went with it um, and hope that, that I'm doing an all right job. Thank you. Brilliant. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll save it off till, till afterwards, maybe afterwards in the Q&A and, and oh, here you go. I've just seen it come through. Have you found any of your skills from other previous roles transferable uh, or transferred to where you are now? Uh, yes, definitely. I did actually have a slide on this, but realized that there was just no time. So this could probably be a slightly longer talk if I was to give it again. Uh, but certainly a lot of things around uh, team working and communication, uh, planning and organizing, it all fits in really nicely with a career in software development, especially with agile principles uh, in place. You constantly work as a team, uh, you plan your work, you prioritize, um, you've got to be able to communicate it and also explain technical concepts to both non-technical people. So maybe your scrum master or uh, some of the BAs aren't as technical um, or have, having a discussion with your technical colleagues. Um, if you can explain what the problem is, <laughs> that really goes a long way. Brilliant. Thanks, Dominica. Thanks, Sam and Carson. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the uh, the next presentation. Just a second, then. I'm just going to pop this open letter there. So again, as I said at the beginning, if you want to learn more about who we are, then feel free to click that link. Uh, and above, Dom Carlo has posted a link where you can add feedback um, for any of the talks today. Um, and so you can do that like after after every talk, um, if you don't mind. Um, especially as Dominica says, so first lightning talk. So please do, um, yeah, please do add some feedback. Uh, so next we have Lauren. Lauren Ali, are you are you good there? Are you you all set? Yeah, I will try and share my screen now. Oh, hopefully you can see this. Can you see the screen? Cool. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, today my talk's called "You Are the Product: Demanding Data Transparency in a Data Driven World." So I'm going to be talking about the changes to WhatsApp's privacy policy, the reaction, and why it's important. Uh, this is my first. This is also my first lightning talk. So yeah, I would really appreciate any feedback and everything. So, bit about me: I'm a tech degree apprentice at PwC. So technically, I'm still sort of in between university and working. So very early on in my career but I'm really interested in data science, machine learning and data ethics. So especially how data-driven tools impact disadvantaged people in society. And a little fun data fact about me is that last year I discovered 588 new artists on Spotify. So if you need recommendations for new music, feel free to contact me and let me know because I have many. Right, so here is a screen that popped up when I opened WhatsApp. Um, a few months ago, which said that they were updating its terms of privacy policy. And normally when pop-ups like this come up in apps, I just click agree and I just blindly accept whatever um, they show me. But I thought this was very interesting because it meant that WhatsApp was actually changing how they would handle your data. So I thought, why don't I actually read the privacy policy, which is something I never do. I never really read terms and conditions. And what I found was really interesting, actually. So here, it, it says that WhatsApp service and how we process your data is going to be updated. And in this section, there is a part called automatically collected information. And this includes your usage and log information. So this is anything from how long you spend using WhatsApp, how often you open the app. This could also be how long you're spending on video calls or voice calls with your friends. They'll even track all your group chat icons and descriptions. And if you think about it, I'm not sure about you all, but I have a lot of group chats, which, you know, um, my personality really comes through with those uh, group chat names and everything. So if they take all this data, they're really building up quite a good picture of who you are and your usage habits, as well as taking your location data. So it even says that if you do not use WhatsApp's location related services, then they can come up with an estimate for your location using your IP address and your phone number area code. 
So we're also looking at how businesses are going to be using WhatsApp for making payments in the future so that Facebook, um, who's the parent company of WhatsApp, can really build revenue from the app and also using your WhatsApp data with Facebook company products. So this includes Instagram, um, Facebook Messenger, Facebook social media itself. And it's very vague in the privacy policy what they're going to do with that, say they were going to use it to improve their services and customise them. But what does that actually mean? And another thing that's very worrying about these updates to the privacy policy is that previously, if you didn't want your data to be shared with Facebook companies, you could just opt out and it would be fine. But now if you opt out, you cannot use WhatsApp anymore. And if after this talk, you get very frustrated and want to um, uninstall WhatsApp on your phone, you actually can't, um, you actually can't and have your data deleted because you need to go into your account settings and disable your account for your Facebook to no longer have your data. So why does Facebook do this? Well, Facebook, the parent company of WhatsApp, has 21.2 billion US dollars in advertising revenue in the first quarter of 2020. So your data is making this company very, very lucrative. What has been the outcry of these changes? Well, I was very, very shocked when I, when I heard the public outcry because you have rival apps like Signal and Telegram getting so many more users. So um, after the updates to the privacy policy happened, we had 500 million active users on Telegram. And the founder of Telegram said this was the largest digital migration in history. That's what he called it. And we even have um, countries like India and Turkey really challenging Facebook. So in India, we had a petition filed in front of the Del Delhi High Court about how these changes to the privacy policy um, cannot be accepted. And India is WhatsApp's largest market because it, um, knowing that India has such a high population. And what's even more interesting to me personally is knowing that WhatsApp has shared your data with Facebook for years. So this update isn't really much anything new. This has happened since 2016. So why has there been such a big public outcry now? In my opinion, I think this is because there's an increase in what I like to call data consciousness and really having um, data ownership and data privacy at the forefront of our minds when interacting with big tech companies. So, for example, Apple has recently introduced privacy labels on iOS apps. So you can see what these apps are doing with your data. And not to anyone's surprise, I'm sure Facebook has really been quite outraged by this new change. Recently, we had The Social Dilemma come out on Netflix, which is a documentary about how big tech companies are using your data. And I think a lot that documentary really opened people's eyes into the way they build up a profile of you and use it for targeted advertising. Even Tim Berners-Lee, who created the World Wide Web, has now got a startup called Enrupt, which is working on building web infrastructure to increase data ownership and data transparency so that you as a user can decide which apps use your data and the companies do not have the power over you that they currently have. So in conclusion, I just want everyone from this talk to take away that sometimes things seem to be too good to be true. If you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. And since I last gave this talk, I just want to make aware that even Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, has said very similar words to this in reference to Facebook. So I think we just need to keep our eyes peeled and maybe we do need to check those terms and conditions next time. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Lauren. That was really interesting, really insightful. Uh, I think it's it's frightening, isn't it? All this stuff that happens, like you say, it's just so easy to, to tick the box, um, but it's nice to see uh, so much so much kind of information coming from so many people around the edges that that kind of make you, make you realize this stuff that, that you, you weren't aware of. Um, does anyone have any questions? Again, please unmute your mic and... Um, uh, and I should be able to see who you are. I may well have got away with this. Um, and also, please, guys, um, if you can uh, add um, any feedback, uh, the link again is at the the top of the chat on there. Um, so please do um, add your add your feedback on that. Um, Stefania, what what did you think about this uh, about that and and this this 
topic in I'm general. Being, I'm being a really good, you know, co-host. I'm making little feedback notes on, on each speaker. So I'll come to Dominica's at the end. But in terms of with Lauren's, very topical. Well, well done for your first talk. It was awesome. Uh, very topical uh, content. I've had, I am a technical person surrounded by non-technical people. And even my mum's neighbour asked my mum to ask me what about the WhatsApp privacy rules. Um, you know, personal story, the guy I'm dating has deleted WhatsApp. So I had to get Signal just to continue to talk to him which is annoying, but that's the world we live in. Um, and in terms of with the talk, I thought it, you explained the technical concepts really well and you also very, very well researched. It's always good to have some nice stats, you know, the Facebook review, um, you had the social dilemma, which obviously when that came out, it was really, you know, uh, I watched it and I've turned all the notifications off my phone, like it makes a difference. Um, so yeah, overall, really good, really good talk and yeah, very well researched um, and yeah, very interesting as well. Thank Great, you. thanks Stefania and thanks Lauren. Um, okay, next up we have Steve Hornsey. So Steve, are you are you ready? Are you all set? Yeah, I hope so. I will start trying to share my screen. Cool, can everyone see my slides? Great. So Today, I'm going to be talking about my experiences as a front end developer who went on call for the first time and what I learned and how I think I, it made me become a better developer. So, I'm Steve. I'm a full stack developer at Elliptic, and normally I spend my time making pretty UIs. I think probably my biggest concern at work is ensuring that my component library is extendable enough and it's accessible to all the different products that we offer. I never expected that my first talk that I'll be doing externally would be about going on call. So how did I end up being an on-caller? At my company, being on call is completely optional. And there's a little bit of a clique who normally sign up. These are like our most senior DevOps engineers. They're all of our super backend developers that you know just basically exist in Bash. And then there's me, the UI guy. So when an email went around six months ago, I didn't really think I was the best candidate. I could never really find anything in AWS. I moan every time I have to write a SQL query. And I don't really understand how Kubernetes works. But Everyone I've spoken to has always said that being an on-caller is such a great experience. It really broadens your mind, mind um, your, um, your uh, perspective of development and gives you a new view on how to make products. So after signing up and reading what seems like a hundred different knowledge base articles and some dummies guides to Kubernetes. Uh, I decided I start my first shift on call. And everything was going so smoothly until the second day. Now, there's a whole secondary story in here about how um, my partner's parents found a rescue kitten in their village and how we shot up to Northamptonshire to go pick it up. But anyway, we're in pets at home, like literally buying one of everything. And that was the moment that my pager decided to go off for the first time. So I apologized to my fiance and her mother, I rush out of the store and go set up my mobile office in the car. And when you're working on these live incidents, it's not like I normally do on localhost. Normally I'm just working on my own laptop. I'm the only person that can see it. And if I make a mistake, you know, who cares, it's just for me. But in this case, then our systems are down. And I'm the one who's responsible to fix it. We have like SLAs. If we don't maintain a good enough uptime, we have to start giving our customers some refunds. And that is why it is so time critical to fix these things and why I really felt the pressure. This first case, it just turned out it was a, a blip in memory on one of our databases. It was a false alarm, but I was still hooked. I enjoyed the pressure. I enjoyed the rush of being responsible to be the one to fix it. 
And since since then, I've been on call four or five times, including a pretty bleak, sober Christmas Eve. But I don't regret it. I don't regret it because I've come to learn that knowing how things breaks gives you a better idea of how they work and why are they struck why they are structured that way. And I think to summarize some of the key things that I've learned, like the first one was a big takeaway for me. I think six months ago, naively, I asked one of the, the senior architects, like, why don't we just use HTTP for everything? It would make our app structure a lot simpler. But really what I failed to appreciate at the time is we do this for a reason. We do this to protect our load intensive um, microservices by putting queues in front of them to make sure that we never uh, overrun them with, with requests from our, directly from our users. And nothing quite teaches you about the importance of clean error handling and nice logs until you're the one who's wake, woken up at three in the morning to find out why, why on earth your service has decided to switch themselves off for no reason. And finally, I think I've also learned quite a holistic lesson in software development. Previously, I was off the mindset that it's, it's producing usable products, which is important. But as developers, we're not just paid to write code. We're paid to create solutions for our customers. And this just doesn't just encompass the usability. We also need to make them reliable and we need to make them scalable. So whenever our customers try and use them, we're always there for them. So thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions or need more of a sales pitch about why they should sign up for going on call at their companies? Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, again, just unmute if you've got anything you want to add. Chris, I can see you've, you've unmuted. Have you got a question now? Yeah, so thank you very much for that great talk. It brings back some memories for me because I used to do on-call customer support quite a few years ago. And I found at the time that I like it set my anxiety off like massively, like I was properly stressed out by the whole experience. Do you have any tips for dealing with that anxiety? Um, yes, I I also find it really sets off my anxiety, but I also realise that I'm a person and not perfect, and therefore I will make mistakes. There'll be other people on the team who are far more knowledgeable. Um, about the inner workings of the systems and would be able to fix it faster than me. But at the end of the day, we're a team. Um, they've put their knowledge in articles and I've been pointed to them. And at most people can expect from me that I can log on to our knowledge base and, and, and find the correct article which fixes the problem. And beyond that, the only thing that I can do is escalate it to the correct people if I can't. Fair play, wise words. Thank you. I'm going to keep trying to uh, adopt that sort of attitude. <laughs> I like that. Plus that that um, that story about your um, is it your your fiance's the, the kitten that, that they yeah. they found. Is that right? That I yeah. mean, how important you must look at that point. No, sorry, I'm I'm just too important. I've got to go and deal with this big issue at work. I like that. I like that. Um, it was, okay, it was more complete panic, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> okay great cool so um again feedback please on the link uh, if you can find it uh in in the chat uh, should be towards the top um and next up we have sam um sam you're good yeah you're set um you should be co-host so you should be able to yeah go ahead and share your screen as and when you're ready okay hi everybody can everybody see my screen okay yeah so hi everyone, uh, my name's Sam and I'm here today to talk about the five step process for finding a mentor. So within my talk, I'll introduce who I am and the reasons why I seek out a mentor, uh, the five step process and the summary of what I found. I'm a marketing executive for a major airline. However, during a uh, fellow of last year, I decided to retrain into user research. This is a field I have no prior knowledge or prior contacts within the field. So I decided to do a bit of research and the top, uh, I suppose, tip that came out was to find a UX mentor. Um, so the process took me about three months of 
understanding why I needed a mentor. So it was about finding somebody who I could connect with about career progression and change, understanding about resources that I could find out and just how I could take my skills from marketing to use research and understanding how I could upskill that. Um, so I did a bit of research in terms of understanding who I could approach. Um, I seeked out about 10 people, but only got about five uh, people responding to my uh, respondents. Um, really good response in terms of giving me information about how I can progress, looking at tools that I could use, and looking at general improvements of how I could position myself better to be in like a user research role. Um, there's only one person and I'm still in contact with with my UX mentor called Laura, who is a uh, head of design and research for a government body. Um, so I meet with her once a month going through uh, a project I'm going through, looking at uh, job descriptions and how I can position myself better to UX marketing into the experience to upskill myself difficult process but I kind of wanted to think okay if I was in this shoes how would I go about it so uh, yeah I suppose again so I come up with a five-step process um, in terms of what I would suggest um, to do next time so one is defining the purpose of why I wanted a mentor um, so for me it was particular was about career change but it could have been about going into a new industry upskilling on a particular skill like public speaking or it could be just I suppose understanding a bit more about I suppose yeah career, career change so for me in particular it was defining why I wanted to career change and understanding the particular aspects of it so looking at understanding okay how can I um, improve within this uh, field any contacts any resources so for me, it was kind of having that set criteria of what I was looking for. Number two is research organisations and potential mentors. Uh, so the process could be going through the mentor uh, meet mentor scheme, um, UXPA, LinkedIn, just research people that are relevant within the field or type of thing you're looking to improve on. Research them, looking at their history, looking at how you can relate back to them. And looking at that key connection in terms of how you can build that communication and relationship with them. Number three is a write email. That looks so basic on it, but for me, it's kind of like writing a, a standardized email in terms of writing what you want out of, um, I suppose, the first contact with them. So, for example, you could say about, I want to know more about understanding about the field of user research what was your experience and then going about yourself and the reasons why you're interested in contacting them and what you can bring across into the relationship between the mentee and mentor so it's just basically having that script so you can be prepared to contact them which is the next step in terms of reaching out to the list that you've created in terms of the people you want to contact so reach out in terms of having something that connects you with them so for me with my mentor now it was interesting because the first line I contacted her with was saying oh I realized you live in Bournemouth uh, that's where I'm from and where my parents are from so I had that with within the email to actually start that uh, relationship building um, so make sure it's specifically tailored to them when you're reaching out to them uh, making sure that you've researched who they are make sure that you research in terms of the connections you can build with them and how they can help you whether it's short term medium term long term but i wouldn't say specifically ask them to be a mentor there's some advice you know when you say seek a mentor it's kind of like you don't want to go straight in there you want to kind of understand is there a relationship or connection there to start off with and that's what happened with the first five people that I contacted. Uh, there wasn't really a relationship there. It was just um, basic art question and answers and that was it. But to build on that relationship has to be a growing progress uh, within where you want to go. Um, also don't fear rejection. There's gonna be times where you think, oh my gosh, nobody's responding to my email. Is it because of my approach? Is it because I'm not, don't worry about it. Sometimes people are busy and you just need to keep going and keep applying till you find somebody who will be your mentor. Number five and final step is schedule and plan the connection between yourself and the mentor. Both of you can have busy schedules, so it's important to have this two-way relationship and communication that you make sure you plan when you're going to meet. So for me, I meet on a monthly basis for an hour with Laura to go through um, what I'm learning, what I need help with, and any additional advice. But it could be um, daily, uh, it could be weekly, it could be um, fortnightly. Just make sure that it's on a regular basis and make sure that you bring something to the table at each meeting that you're struggling with. 
so you can improve and grow. So thank you very much for listening to my talk today. Hopefully I've given you an insight uh, into understanding how I um, found a mentor and the five step process of researching, defining what you want from a mentor and I suppose the relationship building um, steps into finding yourself a mentor. Thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Sam. This, this mentorship is a subject that is, is very, very close to, to my heart. Uh, so we've obviously um, uh, set up the uh, Meet a Mentor um, organization community for, for this exact reason, to try and help people connect with mentors. And we've done like something like 3,000 introductions through it. Um, and it's because we have like quite a, a long uh, form to fill out when people get started. Um, and creating that was because most of the people that signed up didn't have your, your first point was, was, uh, what's the purpose defining the purpose. Is that right? Yeah, um, that's right. And so many people would sort of come to us and say, I want a mentor. And we'd say, okay, why? And they'd be like, I don't know really, but I want a mentor. And, and it is, it's, it's very hard to do, isn't it? And uh, that's so important. And if you do, yeah, you're much more likely to, to get somebody that, that, that will help you, that wants to help you and all that. So no, really, really interesting, really important points. Um, Carly, I can see you've, you've unmuted there. Did you want to um, jump in, ask any questions? I did have one actually, Sam. So one of the things that I've had with mentor relationships in the past is if it's not working, it's a really awkward thing to try and sever it. And you obviously talked about that was one of the things you had to do because there were certain relationships that didn't click. So do you have any tips on how to nicely sever those relationships that are just not working out? Um, for me, I kind of, well, I'm not really sure if you're to you because the relationship I have with my current mentor is really well and sort of it's, the, I suppose for me, it's not severing it. But I suppose with previous ones, I've kind of just emailed them saying, thank you very much for your time. And that's it. I think for me, it's just expressing gratitude for helping them out. But um not wanting to continue like say i want to meet at this time mm -hmm. so yeah kind of hopefully that answers the question no it does it makes sense <laughs> very difficult though isn't it very difficult when you've got somebody that wants to help and has helped and then yeah trying to trying to walk away just being very very grateful and, and stopping asking questions is is sort of the uh, safe safest i guess but god i mean it's it's tricky isn't it? it's tricky with um, that kind of thing brilliant thank you um sam well in fact sam and now on to carly um <laughs> For the for the final talk then um are you ready you all set there yeah let's just share let's do this okay that's the right one cool so roll call can people see my screen amazing cool so thank you everyone um happy friday so as everyone's probably seen me in a few of these things um my name is carly um so i'm a software engineer and scrum master at morgan stanley but what i want to talk to you about today is an example of what i consider to be a rather good mashup of different practices so what i've found is when we write software sometimes you come across a particular practice or technology or technique that you want to try out and sometimes they work great on their own but sometimes you do have to really mash them together to try and produce a technique that's more powerful and useful. And with that inspiration in mind, I want to share today my reflections on how I found combining behavioral specifications from behavior driven development with end to end testing. I've talked about how it's beneficial and I'll show you a very brief example using a couple of technologies I'm familiar with to help you get started. But before all of that, I've called this the ultimate mashup and a few people are probably thinking, what do you mean by a mashup? Well, a mashup from music is when you take two songs and you combine them together and hope to make something that's a little bit catchier. And one great recent example, which actually inspired this talk was Ben Howell's mashup where he combined Dua Lipa's Hallucinate with the BBC News theme with the beak. Um, and it was actually really good. It kind of went a bit nuts on Twitter. BBC News actually ran it as their theme one day and actually won the remix of the year at the BBC Radio 1 Lockdown Awards. Um, and I can give you the link if anyone wants to check it out. But it's Ben's spirit of combining something together to make something better that I'm trying to embody here. And I'm hoping that you'll come to see that when combining BDD and end testing together, we're doing that same spirit of finding something that's more useful. So let me give you a brief overview if you're anyone who's unfamiliar with what these terms are. So BDD or behavior driven development is a practice that involves from the test driven development movement. 
and basically it's where you try and find new features by collaborating directly with relevant business partners and producing from that kind of process a set of examples that then can drive the implementation and testing of the features that you're going to build. And it's the partnership element that's really important in that. Um, sometimes quite often people talk about BDD, including in my work, and they'll refer to it as the actual examples are the BDDs. Um, and I'm going to take a leaf out of Seb Rose's book and basically talk about explicitly the examples of the behavioural specifications, which you'll see later. And BDD is the process that we use to elicit those. And then E to E or end to end testing is referring to the ability to test the end user workflow by recreating the product experience from their own perspective. So you're basically testing the entire product as they see it from the beginning to the end. And it's that user perspective aspect, which is exactly why it merges with these behavior driven development practices so well. Those behavioral specifications, if you think about it, are examples that are in their viewpoint and it exposes their perspective to us. So basically, it helps us walk in our users' shoes. And these documented examples can then be used in your testing to make it more understandable, not only for the stakeholders and people that you've worked with, but also new and existing developers who might be trying to get up to speed with these new features and how they're intended to operate as well. So let's reinforce this point of understanding with what I hope is a rather simple example. I'm using Cucumber here, which is the scenario section that you can see here. And then we'll see Protractor comes in later for the link of the end-to-end -end testing to help you access the page and things. So in this kind of Cucumber format, which is using what's called the Gherkin specification, you can see it's nice in terms of it's very English-like format. You've got those kind of keywords such as given to set things up, which is an orange when to specify your exact action, which is what the user wants to do really. And then you've got your then statements, which basically set up what you expect to happen. And you can also see that you can customize these to make elements of these reusable. So here in this example, I've got two green elements, one of which is the title for the page. And then the last one is that little table, which has my artists. And because I work in financial systems, the table format in particular is quite useful. We use these a lot of times in, in our features. And then for those who are interested in the code connection, rather than the English syntax to see how it connects together, this is the specification. So these are basically the, the code that we connect to those particular lines in order to execute what the user workflow is. So each particular kind of scenario element, such as given, which I've highlighted here, we can use the Cucumber framework to tie that particular kind of matched keyword. So I'm on the home page, and connect it to an action that we want to do in code. So in here, all I'm doing is basically I'm waiting for the page navigate to option, basically navigate to the page to happen in the code. And then the one that's more interesting is our then statement. So you'll see I'm passing in that data table, that list of artists that I had before. And into that, I can then get the results from the particular page, which you can see in this section here. And then I'm doing an assertion. So I'm checking if the artists that I've passed in that test actually match here too. So since we're reaching the end, let me quickly summarize the key lessons I've shared today. So combining specifications from BDD with end-to-end -end testing definitely for me works very better than using these practices individually. I've given you an overview of what these terms are and a clear explanation of how they highlight the user perspective for how your application is intended to work and I've covered a very brief example. If you want to dig into the code more that's the link to my GitHub there and I can share it in the chat afterwards too. So thank you for listening. Um, do reach out if you'd like to find out more or ask me any questions and also take us as inspiration that there are loads of different techniques and technologies that can be mashed together to make something better. And with that, I'll open up for questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Carly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Helen. Two things. Firstly, there is an excellent game called Mashup. Secondly, um... <laughs> I'll need to put <laughs> that in then. <laughs> um, would you... Where would you fit in your mashup um, ethos uh, exploratory testing? Uh, I have would done. You not? Would you leave that to one side? 
I might leave that to one side because I've done absolutely none. Um, so the types of testing, I guess <sighs> we're not really good at exploratory testing. And I think that's part of the reason why I prefer this end to end element. Because when we think in the front end side about exploratory testing, it's basically mucking about with the product, clicking things. It's, it's what it's what I've spent my career doing. So yes, that's all I know how to do yeah. is press things. <laughs> so the way that I see, I find it doesn't work because it's so easy to forget something. And then yeah. if you find something breaks and you've got a client yelling at you that something's broken because you've not picked up because you forgot and you didn't find it. Oh, yeah, It's not a so testing strategy in its own right, for sure. Definitely. So this is one of the reasons that I like this end to end element, because you kind of agree the workflow and you can test against their expectation. And it yep. also documents how they expect the system to work, because even this week, I've been having debates with some of our developers on how the behavior of a drop down should work. And you just don't have things like that if you have this idea of what the workflow is and it's clear. Yep. I think exploratory yep. works well for just, you know, getting familiar with a product, especially if you've moved into a new space. But as yep. a strategy, Agreed. it's not great. And I think this way works better, like the way traditionally in my kind of team we've handled this before we started doing end-to-end -end testing, is we'd have these huge Excel run books with all these steps to make sure that you don't miss something when you explore. But then that needs to be maintained. So you may as well try and shift it to code if you can. Yeah, thank you. Well, and Carly, I think we had one more from uh, James whose microphone isn't working. Um, but what environment do you test against for E2E? Oh, I could do a talk just on that. <laughs> so I think you need to be careful here. Um, and I think it depends partially. My opinion, and I'll make this clear, it's an opinion is that it depends at what point in the pipeline you're looking to run this because in our area at the moment we have them running directly against basically a QA instance so it runs and connects to the services if you're doing local development that's a pain because if your QA environment's down for whatever reason maybe something's went wrong you then are delayed because you have to go and fix it and then that kind of holds you up um so in this sense, some instances like local development, I can see the need for mocks. What I'd then say is later on in the pipeline, what I'd suggest is, you know, you could use this as a potential replacement for user engagement testing, which is something that we have to do. So what I'd say at that point is I would just have as part of your pipeline ping the UET services or whichever environment you want to run against at that point, ping the services directly but introduce that a bit later on in the pipeline. But it's a very opinionated subject. I know people that say you shouldn't mock it ever. It must ping your tests, uh, ping your services, or it's not true end to end. And I, I'm more of a middle ground kind of person thinking that sometimes it makes sense to mock and sometimes it makes sense to ping the service. You've, um, you've accidentally signed yourself up for your next talk, by the way. <laughs> We've well, just had two requests for it in the chat, so. Um... Really? Oh, yeah. it's a good thing I started a blog on it then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> work, me and Dom will work something out. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the end of our lightning talk. So